Good afternoon. Welcome to the Piscataway Public Library. My name is Heidi Kramer. I'm the director of the library. It is my great privilege and honor to welcome you to our Juneteenth program, welcoming Dr. Opal Lee. I'm so pleased that Mayor Brian Waller is with us this afternoon. So he has some remarks before we welcome Joy Robinson to the program. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to uh, make some announcements. Some of the officials that are here, we have our council president, Gabrielle Cahill, who's in the back. Uh, standing next to her is Councilman Dennis Espinoza, and then also Councilwoman Sharon Carmichael. And I see the former mayor of Plainfield, Sharon Robinson's in the house. Uh, I acknowledge Lynn Hartman from the Board Library Board of Trustees. Where are you, Lynn? I know you're here in the front row. And then also Kim Lane on the Library Board of Trustees. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out today. Uh, I want to also thank the Middlesex County Commissioners for sponsoring this event, as well as the NAAC branch of the Metuchen, Edison, and Piscataway branch, as, as right there. We have to get that in there. So actually, Piscataway, believe it or not, are re is represented by three branches of the NAACP. I guess uh, they still haven't figured out who's really going to represent us. Right, right Reggie? Uh, I want to thank Dr. Lee for coming out of her busy schedule to come to our great township. I was, had an opportunity to speak with her for a few minutes uh, before the program, telling her a little bit about the history of our, our town. Uh, and then I asked her, I said, what did it, did it feel like when you were at the White House signing, or then when the president was signing your signature? I said, what were you really feeling inside of it? And you know what she said? She felt like twerking. <laughs> 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 well, Dr. Lee, if you didn't twerk in the White House, you can twerk here at the Piscataway Library. We want to see that, right, Dr. Lee? I, 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 I was laughing hysterically when she said that. So, Dr. Lee, thank you uh, for your busy schedule and your family members for coming up here and enriching the lives of many of the citizens of Middlesex County and also Piscataway Township. You're always welcome back. And yes, you can twerk any time here. I'm, gonna... <laughs> I'm gonna turn the mic over here. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming out. Um, I always forget to do this, and Heidi did already introduce me, but I'm, so I'm practicing. It's, um, my name is Joy Robinson. I'm a librarian here at Piscataway Public Library, and I want to welcome you all to a conversation with Dr. Lee. Um, Piscataway Public Library is proud to partner with the NAACP of Metuchen, Edison, and Piscataway Area Branch, um, and to welcome Dr. Lee to the Piscataway community. This program, as the mayor already said, is funded by a grant uh, provided by the Board of Middlesex County Commissioners and the Middlesex County Division of Arts and History. Just wanna make sure we get that shout out more than once. <laughs> okay, because we are so grateful for them to uh, get this uh, auspicious occasion here. Um, for those of you who don't know the history, uh, the story of how Juneteenth became a federal holiday, I am happy to tell you that it is thanks in large part to the courage and ingenuity of the phenomenal woman, I was gonna say you see on the stage, but she's not on the stage yet. So <laughs> to the phenomenal woman you can barely see yet, but she'll be on the stage in a minute. Um, in 2016, at 89 years old, Dr. Lee began the Opal's Walk campaign in a bid to call attention to the fact that Juneteenth was not yet a federal holiday. Dr. Lee began the movement that thousands of others took up walking from Fort Worth, Texas to Washington, D.C., some 1,400 miles. It's an, it's an ironic reversal of the time and distance it took for the message of freedom, the Emancipation Proclamation, to reach Texas, the westernmost state in the Confederacy, from Washington, D.C. On January 1, 1863, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, but the message did not reach more than the more than 250,000 enslaved people in Texas 
until more than two years later, when on June 19, 1865, 2,000 Union troops arrived at Galveston Bay, Texas, and announced that they were free by federal decree. Similarly, some five years after Opal's Walk campaign began, Washington, D.C. got the message, and the current Joe Biden, Kamala Harris administration issued a proclamation that Juneteenth would become a federal holiday on June 17th, 2021. I, uh, at this point, I was going to introduce Michelle Hang. Oh, there you go. Oh, okay. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce um, Community Outreach Coordinator for the NAACP of Metuchen, Edison, and Piscataway Branch, um, Michelle Haynes, who will introduce Dr. Opal Lee. Thank you. Wow, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all so much for coming out today to, to celebrate, to honor, to uplift, and I think most importantly, to thank Dr. Opal Lee for all that she has done for African Americans here in the United States, and I'm sh pretty sure abroad, right? Dr. Lee's reach is not just in the U.S. borders. Um, you know, Joy touched on her making that trek at the age of 89. I told my daughter, I said, you now have no excuse when you say you're too tired in the morning. And it's also good to remind our young people as well that what you believe in, what you hope for, what you dream for can become a reality if you persevere if you try, if you're passionate about what you do. And those are all things that Dr. Opal Lee is. Um, again, thank you all for coming today. The NAACP Metuchen Edison Piscataway Branch. Let's clap for that. The NAACP Metuchen Edison Piscataway Branch uh, is led by some tireless folks. Um, I would like to introduce any of the executive team that's here. I know I see most of you here, yes? Okay, so it's our president, Reginald Johnson. <laughs> Roberto Sayers is our member at large. <laughs> Devon Pender is our youth coordinator. <laughs> and there are a few others who were not here today because we have been celebrating Dr. Lee all weekend long. If you haven't been following us on Facebook, primarily where we're at, so Facebook at N-A-A-C-P-M-E-A-B, follow us. Uh, Dr. Lee arrived to New Jersey Friday and she has been moving ever since. <laughs> So we had our Freedom Fun Gala on Friday evening, which was fantastic. There was a welcome lunch here at the East Jersey Old Village. So it was Piscataway that welcomed Dr. Lee to New Jersey. Okay, yesterday was our Freedom Fun, oh, excuse me, our a Freedom Day celebration where we celebrated Juneteenth um, in various ways as our children's area and Dr. Lee definitively addressed the crowd who was just left in awe and standing on their feet. Um, she needed like hardcore security to get through the crowd. <laughs> and of course today we had to bring it back to Piscataway um, for what I'm gonna dub as a, a very interesting, meaningful conversation. Um, our inaugural Dr. Opal Lee Youth Scholar, Anadia Haynes, is a former Piscataway Public School student. She's an aspiring professional dancer. She dances with Eastside Dance Project there out of North Plainfield. Uh, and she's also a little good with the academics as well. Uh, she's an honors student. She's received the New Jersey Governor's Award in Arts Education and a few citations from mayors such as Mayor of Perth Amboy, 
um, and a congressional letter of note from Congressman Pallone. So I'm going to have Anadia Haynes come up and the conversation is between Dr. Opali and our 18 year old student. What could these two possibly have in common? What can they really talk about? And more importantly, what can we glean? What can we learn through their conversation? Okay, Anadia, if you'd come up. And thank you again for coming. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. My name is Inadia Haynes. I am proud to honor and welcome Dr. Opa Lee to this event. Um, we are here to celebrate the efforts of a woman who is known for perseverance, justice, and freedom. Dr. Opa Lee, often referred to as the grandmother of the Juneteenth movement and a 2024 Presidential Medal of Freedom winner, has dedicated her life to ensuring that the significance of June 19, 1865 is recognized and celebrated across our nation. I'm excited to hear from Dr. Opali herself um, about her work, her challenges that she's faced, the victories that she has won, and her vision for the future. Dr. Opali's story is one of courage, hope, and inspiration. So will everyone please stand and help me recognize and welcome the remarkable Dr. Opal Lee. All right, um, starting off with question number one. Dr. Lee, can you share a pivotal moment from your childhood that has shaped your passion for activism? I didn't even know what white people looked like. Um, there was the L.B. Price man that came around in his car selling cookware and clothing and all kinds of things. He didn't look white to me, so. And then there was Moranto's store that was close to the college, Wiley University now, and they didn't look white. So I never saw white people or interacted with them until I moved to Fort Worth. And my parents moved there in 1939. They bought a home, um, 940 East Annie Street. And my mom had it fixed up so nice, 19th of June. But some 500 people gathered. The paper said, and the police were there, and my dad came with a gun from work, and the police told him if he busted a cap, they would let the mob have us. Our parents sent us to friends several blocks away, and they left under cover of darkness. Those people drug the furniture out and burned it. They did despicable things. But our parents never, ever discussed it with us. Never, ever. So I guess I buried it really deep until somebody, when I'm close to 100 years old, asked me about it. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's been public knowledge. What else am I supposed to say? <laughs> um, who were your role models growing up, and how did that influence your path? Uh, I, I, I ended up finishing high school at 16, but there was a vice principal. Her name was um, Hazel Harvey Peace. Tiny little lady, uh, I don't think she weighed 100 pounds dripping wet, but she was the um, dean of girls at I Am Terrell High School. And besides Miss Peace, uh, my mom 
and my grandparents. Oh, oh. My grandfather was short, stocky, and when he spoke, you thought you were listening to E.F. Hutton or somebody. Everybody did what Grandpa said. There was no doubt, no doubt about it. And of course, when my mom married and moved away to Marshall, my mother was the one that you listened to. You had to listen if you wanted to survive. And what was one of the biggest obstacles you faced in your fight for Juneteenth's recognition? And how did you overcome it? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that I had the obstacles. I am, um, we, friends gathered at Baker Chapel, African Methodist Episcopal Church, and they gave me this big send off. And I started walking 1,400 miles from Fort Worth to Washington, D.C. <clears throat> I don't remember a single person being negative. Now, I tried to give a gentleman a flyer, and he brushed me off. And I figured he was late to work, and he didn't have time to fly. <laughs> Other than that, didn't have any obstacle. OK. Um, what advice would you give to young people today who want to make a difference in their community? I'd ask them, not just the one pe young people, but everybody in this audience, to make yourself a committee of one, to change somebody's mind. You know people who aren't on the same page you are on. Change their minds. Not going to happen in a day. You're going to have to work at it. But if people have been taught to hate, they can be taught to love. And it's your responsibility. <laughs> How do you envision the future of Juneteenth celebrations across the country? Oh, already we are seeing so many other states and, and all around the nation, not just ours, around the world, people are celebrating Juneteenth. And I'm wanting them to know that it's not just a festival that it means freedom, not just for black people, not just for people in Texas, but for all people, freedom. And we aren't free yet. <laughs> we've made some strides, and I mean some great strides, but we've got a long way to go. We've got disparities, the homelessness, the joblessness, health care that some people can get and others can't, and climate change that we are responsible for. And I tell you, if we don't do something about climate change, we all going to hell in a handbasket. Uh, yeah, uh, I was all over the United States. I left Fort Worth. I went to Arlington, Grand Prairie, Dallas, Box Springs. I went to Texarkana, Little Rock. If I tell you I was all over the place I was. And there were people who joined me. And do you know there was not a single incident that was won? I offered a gentleman a flyer, and he brushed me aside. I figured he was late to work, and he didn't want to be bothered. 
That's all. <laughs> what are your hopes and dreams for the next generation of activists and change makers? I want to, have I not said, I want you to make yourself a committee of one. Have I told you that? Yeah. That's it. I want you to work at it. What qualities do you think are essential for effective leadership in social justice movements? Determination. Steadfastness. If you believe in something passionately that's going to help you, your family, your community, and I mean the larger community, don't give up on it. You may have setbacks. People may think you're crazy. They thought I was. <laughs> but if it's worthwhile, it's worth fighting for. So for heaven's sakes, don't give up on what you start. As a young woman, what specific advice would you give to other young women who inspire to be leaders and change makers? Education, 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 education. <laughs> you can do a lot of things once you get an education. I don't want you to do like I did. I finished high school at 16, and my mom was going to send me back to Marshall, to Wiley. It's a university now, but I got married. She was so disappointed. She, she wouldn't even go to the wedding at Baker Chapel AMA Church. And it took me four years and four babies to realize I was gonna have to raise my husband too. <laughs> I, cut, I, I, I cut my losses and had nerve enough to go home to my mother and say, I'm ready to go to college now. <laughs> she says, I got no money to send you to nobody's college. She says, I'll keep your children. I worked, I worked like a Trojan to get the money to go to Wiley. And guess what I did? I spent it. I bought the children a television so she wouldn't have to run all over the neighborhood looking for them. <laughs> I went to Wiley without a dime. They put me to work in the college bookstore. Now, I didn't quit the job in Fort Worth because I didn't know what was going to happen. She kept it during the week. I'd come back and work the weekend. She'd collect the check. The work got done. Nobody noticed it. And I couldn't stay Wiley four years. I was through in three and a half. I got back to Fort Worth and got a job teaching that paid $2,000 a year. I couldn't feed four children on $2,000 a year. I got another job. If I was at school from 8 to 3, there'd be a car waiting for me. And from 4 to 12, I worked at Lockheed Martin. I'd still be there, but they laid people off from time to time. <laughs> Looking back at your life's work, is there anything you wish you had done differently? Yeah. I think I would have waited to have children, but they, <laughs> they, oh, Beautiful people. I have three sons and a daughter. 
Now my daughter, getting her through college, took a little doing. But when her daughter got a degree from, um, I think it was TSU, one of the colleges, and her daughter went on to Howard, I think then she finished with two cotton, two cotton picking degrees. And, and, and all three of my sons were in service. They all came home, except they were in Vietnam and, and the youngest, I think, got into Agent Orange. He was paralyzed before he passed away. But uh, children, my daughter has a daughter who is the, let's see, judge of the Northern District of Texas. <laughs> oh, and, and, and that daughter has twin sons, and one of them um, just finished Harvard, and, and he's working in the World Trade Center now. <laughs> The other child is an artistic child, big old fella, looks like a sumo rustling, and we love him to death, you know? Spoiled, too. <laughs> right. That's actually all the questions I have for you. I really appreciate you being here and sitting down with me today. Oh. It's really an honor. I've enjoyed it so much. I tell you, if I didn't have work to do at home, I'd come back here and stay with y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want you to know that you can change the situation we have now. I know I've said it already. But I'm going to repeat it. We have too much, too many homeless people, too many jobless people, too many people who don't have health care. And we can do something about it. We are the richest country in the world. <laughs> and other countries will follow our example. And there's no reason for us not to be one people. I'm looking forward to the day when we are all Americans, not African Americans or Jewish Americans or white Americans or Italian Americans. We are all one people, and let's act like it. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Anadia. Let's give them both another round of applause.